Hi, I'm Greg Euland with Reynolds & Reynolds, and this is Connected. Today, I have the pleasure of sitting down with Ted Ings, uh, who, if you don't know who Ted is, uh, you've, you've probably been hiding under a rock for the last handful of years, if not a couple of decades. He's been around in a bunch of different capacities for a long time. Uh, today, Ted is the Executive Director of the Center for Performance Improvement in Automotive, uh, also the Executive Director of the Fixed Ops Roundtable, uh, which these events just keep coming, so I'm, I'm anxious to uh, get into it with Ted. Uh, Ted, thanks so much for joining. Greg, thanks so much for having me. It's a great honor. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Ted, if you don't mind, um, give a little background on you. You know, we were just chatting uh, just a minute ago about, you know, you've been doing this for 30 years, 30 plus years. Um, tell a little bit of your story and your tale. It seems like everybody's got one, right? And once once we get into automotive, nobody can seem to get out of it because it's too much fun. So what uh, what's a little bit of your story? And Greg, I think I'm like everybody else. I did not intend to get in, but once you're in, you stay. Uh, I've actually been in uh, since 1981. So that's what, 41 years. I worked yeah. retail for 10 years. And by the way, uh, I know you worked retail as well. I think that's a very important foundation for anybody in our industry because without that and when lacking that foundation, it doesn't give you, you don't have the right perspective, I think, you know, to look at a lot of the changes and things that are happening in our industry uh, as well as the disruption. So it's uh, uh, it's been a great uh, time in retail. I started a training company uh, about 30, 31 years ago, and I've been in training all that time on both the variable side, sales, F&I, leasing, and uh, for the past 20 years on the fixed op side. And uh, the fixed op side is really what's moved the needle, Greg. It's moved um, because there's so much interest right now. There's a lot of areas of change right now. You know, you've got the convenience economy. Um, you've got vehicle power supplies and sources that are changing, uh, production, subscription services. All these things are entering into it. And fixed ops is really right in the middle. So we started these conferences about three and a half years ago and haven't looked back. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And you got another one coming up here uh, mid-November. So you just keep just keep cranking them out, which is great. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit, all these changes going on. And, um, you know, w when you look at obviously the future, but also in just today's world, right? I, I come into the store 7 a.m., uh, you know, tomorrow morning, whatever it is. Um, and for most dealers, there's some level of capacity struggle. Whether it's I don't have enough texts, I don't have enough space, enough bays, um, you know, there's there's some level of we're at our ceiling with capacity. So when you think about that, how do dealers grow? How do they get more? It's not it's not like they're sitting there with with people twiddling their thumbs and not having things to do. They don't necessarily or they don't feel like they have more time to sell. So what do they do? How do they grow? How do they continue on that kind of upward trajectory? As you know, our business is always changing. The business we're in today is not the business we were in six months, a year, two years ago. It's been dramatic shifts. And I just uh, interviewed a very big uh, dealer group and the COO told me, you know, it's difficult to plan more than 30, 60, 90 days out with all the different things that are happening in our industry. So um, there's a lot of shifts, a lot of things happening uh, on both, you know, the sales side we mentioned uh, with the uh, new vehicles and with uh, pre-owned uh, with the values of those vehicles. And uh, of course, getting those used vehicles as an example to market. All right. Sure. Uh, and that's now entered into the fixed op side. Uh, as an example, the fixed operations manager, maybe a year or two ago, was not so much involved in the reconditioning process, but today is very much involved because we got to get those vehicles frontline ready a lot quicker. Um, you know, there was talk a few years ago about autonomous vehicles. You don't hear so much about that today. The dominant conversation is more on the EV side, yep. um, the connected services that are going to be involved. And I think dealers are looking for an edge. They're looking for best practices. They're looking to their peers for ideas that work right now. We just went through a period uh, in the last two and a half years where automotive service and parts was considered, a, there was a new term, a, a essential business, right? Yep. And we had to be essential in different parts of the country. I'm in the Northeast to be open. Um, so service and parts continues to be a growth area. And regardless of what happens with uh, uh, how many vehicles I can stock or uh, what that business model will be on the front end, uh, service and parts and body shop remain very stable and strong and continue to grow. Yeah, yeah. And as you think about, you mentioned EVs. Um, 
And you mentioned kind of connected vehicles, and, and that leads you to over-the-air updates and enhancements and things like that. Um, you know, you think back, it wasn't too long ago that every customer you had as a, as a service advisor or service manager, every customer you had, you, you basically got four at-bats with a year. Right. Every three months, every 3000 miles they are coming in for an oil change and, and a, an inspection. Um, in today's world, if you're lucky, you got one, maybe two, depending on the depending on the make. Right. Going forward, as you start to see more and more connected vehicles and you start to see, you know, more and more uh, electric vehicles even coming out with fewer mechanical parts, you, you just the fear is you're going to have fewer at bats, fewer and fewer and fewer, right? We, we used to get four, now we get two, maybe one. What's that going to be in five years? So when, when you think about that, um, you know, how do you make the most of every opportunity is something that I think I'm really curious about when I talk to dealers. And I'm curious what your thoughts are, if, if you have any best practices to share on how do you get the most out of every interaction? Because that's where I think any growth is going to come from. It's not like we're going to get more opportunities with the same customers. It's a great question. Um, with a lot of these changes that are happening, you know, historically, the oil change has been the trigger point to bring the people in. And if we move now to an EV model, and let's look at California, uh, I have a number of dealers that have just been on the fixed ops roundtable in the last year who are telling me that about 20%, maybe as high as 25% of their business is EV. And really? they're attracting, yes, that's California. Now, Florida would probably be a distant second. Um, somewhere between five and 10% uh, as EVs. But wow. what's happening is that um, there's some infrastructure that has to be prepared on the dealer's side to be able to work on these vehicles. Uh, I just had uh, Doug Eero on the show. Doug is the uh, president of Longo Toyota and uh, general manager there as well, and president of Penske Motor Company. They sold 17,000 vehicles last year. They'll sell a little bit less this year because of the production issues. But Doug told me that last month on his service drive, they sold one on the service drive, a thousand prepaid maintenance contracts on the service drive. Hmm. Greg, I've never heard of a dealer selling more than 50. And I mean, and that would be, you know, a five star to get that. They yeah. sold a thousand at Longo last month. And when I asked him why, uh, he told me on the segment, well, they're looking at, you know, perhaps changes in what they can sell in California by 2035. Uh, they are now with EVs, you know, very popular in California as well. And they want to make sure that they get the customer in uh, for five visits over a certain period of time. Going back to your point, making sure that they have the customer in front of them. So with a move to EVs, and that's going to be different in different parts of the country as well. Um you're not going to have so much the mileage, but perhaps more of the time. You're going to need to come in on a timely basis, whether it's once a year, whether it's more often uh, for a tire inspection uh, to look at those tires and then to look at the vehicle. And dealers right now are preparing bundles and packages for what will happen at those different intervals. So, you know, going back to your original question in terms of growth and how do I grow? Uh, dealers need to be on the lookout, on the horizon and preparing for this, because no matter where in the country you are, you're going to be infected in some way, shape or form. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, I want to go back to something else you, you mentioned, Ted. Um, you, you talked about infrastructure needs, you know, and, and kind of what dealers are being almost being forced to do uh, to prepare for the future. And then you also mentioned reconditioning. So when you think about the combination of those two things, right, you have consumer pay vehicles, customer pay vehicles that are coming through, uh, coming through the shop. Um, so you need to have renovations there to be able to work on electric vehicles. Uh, but you also have EVs that you're buying, you know, as a trade in or buying from auction because the market's there for them now. Um, you also need to invest in, you know, your reconditioning facility if you have one. So, um, um, I'm curious what your thoughts are, you know, when, when you look at these infrastructure investments, is it going to start making more sense for dealers, especially if they don't have a massive operation, right? So if they're maybe less than 10 stores, is it going to make sense for them to operate their reconditioning facilities out of their standard shop versus having a recon facility? Or, you know, is there still a case to be made to have a separate recon facility for, you know, specialized uh, technicians over there and processes over there? I, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, two parts. First, uh, to the infrastructure. Uh, part of the infrastructure is going to be to have uh, high speed or fast uh, charging available 
for technicians, uh, going to the customer experience when you come in for something as low as an oil change, you don't want to spend your day at the dealership. Same thing is true with the uh, EV customer. They're going to have to return those vehicles to the customer with a certain minimal charge. And to do that, we need rapid chargers. And dealers are now investing, and this has been quite expensive, in these rapid chargers and the OEMs are very much involved. So you've got a new breed of technicians who want to work on these vehicles, uh, who are interested in the EVs. You've got this expensive infrastructure that it has been taking place now over the last year. And in terms of recon, you know, take a look at the landscape now on reconditioning. Uh, you've got several companies out there with some great products. Uh, I'll mention one of yours, uh, Recon Track, yep. because they help dealers uh, using software to be able to smartly get these vehicles ready. Whether I have a, 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 a independent shop or a third party shop that's doing that for me or a centralized location or whether I'm doing it at my dealership location or nearby, uh, the dealer needs or the decision makers need to be aware uh, of the stakeholders of where my vehicles are in the process. And that's never been more important than it is today, you know, with the the rapid shift in values on uh, unused vehicles. And that's going to continue to be forefront. So now we've got at our fixed ops roundtable that you mentioned earlier, uh, I've got used vehicle managers in high numbers coming to those uh, to watch that because we're talking about reconditioning best practices. And, yeah. um, you know, for me, you know, many years in the business like you, you know, we're still students, we're still learning and we're constantly learning. It's amazing how much will change, you know, in just a few months in our industry and to be aware of what's happening. So a lot, a lot of good things. Yeah. Yeah. You're spot on. Um, so you mentioned fixed ops roundtable. I want to go down that path a little bit too, if you don't mind, Ted. So, uh, your fixed ops roundtable event, uh, at least, you know, in the, the near history has been a virtual event, right? So it's, it's hosted online. Uh, people can tune in, uh, which has been, I think a great format. Um, I'm curious your perspective as somebody that hosts these events. So there's a lot of different ways to do it, right? It just, um, not too long ago, I was out in Vegas for driving sales at their executive summit and digital dealer was not too long ago. Um, heck you might've been out there too. We didn't run into each other, but, um, so you still have these thriving, uh, in-person events that happen. Uh, but I think you also have these thriving online events that are happening. What's your take on the blend between the two, the pros and the cons, um, you know, and is there always a place for both? I don't know. Where, where do you see things heading as far as conferences and get togethers and round table types events? Um, th this stuff, it's great for all of us, but where's it going? Very timely. Uh, I started the first Fix Ops Roundtable in May of 2019 in my in my office boardroom in Manhattan. And I had been encouraged to do that for about three years. And I kept saying, no, Greg, I'm not sure if I even did this. And my boardroom holds like 12 or 15 people. I didn't think anybody would even come, let alone show up. Right? <laughs> so uh, finally, uh, I finally agreed to do it. And uh, again, not sure who would come. And I invited dealers that I had trained you know, to share best practices for a day. And I would buy them, you know, breakfast and lunch. And so kind of a 20 said, group type of setting. Yeah, something small. And uh, yeah. we ended up with 30 people that was they were flowing out into the hall. And um, <laughs> so it was an in-person event. But what I think what really made it take off was the fact that during the meeting, people started taking their phones and holding their phones up and videoing each other. And again, there's not a lot of people in the room but it's very crowded, right? Like a sardine can. They're videoing each other speaking and they put it online. So I think the meeting was on a Thursday and then over that weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, all these videos were circulating online of people speaking in this boardroom and people wanted to know, what is that? What what was that event? And they're talking about parts and service, uh, areas that are not typically, you know, a, not a lot of conferences are devoted, you know, a big time to that. So um, I held the first four of them in person. I did one in Los Angeles later that year. I think we had 100 people. I did another wow. one on the East Coast. Uh, I invited uh, Fred Beans, a uh, big dealer in Pennsylvania, a client of mine for 25 years to speak at the event. And somebody Huge asked parts me, business also, Fred Beans, a massive group, parts business. What a what a great parts operator, right? <laughs> Probably the largest wholesale parts operation, you know, this side of Oregon, right? And Fred mm -hmm. runs it like a trucking company. And people wanted to come hear what Fred had to say. And somebody asked me, they said, well, who's coming from Fred Beans? 
I said, Fred's coming. Fred's going to speak at the meeting. <laughs> I, I never forget, Greg. Uh, and, you you know, if you know Fred, you you would believe this, that he, he called me like every morning for two weeks to go over his presentation to make sure that it would be good and timely. And he drove up with all his managers. And I called Brian Benstock over in Queens at Paragon Honda, another client of mine for 20 years. And I said, Fred's coming. Would you speak? He says, yes. Can I bring my managers to hear Fred? So this is how it kind of came about. So we were doing these physical conferences. We did our last one in Las Vegas, February of 2020, right before things changed. I had yeah. about 300 people in the room for a fixed ops conference. And I, I, I never thought we'd get to 300 people. And then um, we had this, some decisions to make. You know, do we continue the conference? We The whole nature of meeting now in person, flying on an airplane, in a room with other people, shaking hands, that was all out the window, right? It didn't work anymore. Right. And some people said, well, wait till this blows over. And I said, well, let's try to make this work virtually for one day. I had 50 speakers committed to be in Dallas. And as much as I wanted to, the CDC kept changing the guidelines until it was no more than 25 people, then no more than five people in a, in a room for a meeting. So I had to go online and we went live for a one day event with 48 speakers. And I'll never forget it because we refunded the audience's money back, gave everybody their admission. And I think I had 12 sponsors at the time and I sent everybody a check back. And they said, well, why did you do that? We didn't even ask you. I said, well, I don't know if it's going to work. We could crash, right? It's going to be live. And fortunately, we pulled it off eight hours. It didn't crash. And uh, now we had 2,500 people at the event. And we yeah. never would have had 2,500 people in a room. And then we did another one a few months later. And we started giving them themes. This was our fifth one. We called it uh, Back to the Future, all right? And, and now we had 4,500 people attend. And again, this was a free event. And I told the sponsors, same thing, because that was a pretty dicey time. If you have the money, pay. If you don't, you're going to speak anyway. Don't worry about it. And uh, I think we probably won those companies over for life. They'll never forget that. And we've kept it free ever since. And uh, what I've learned is that um, for a service and parts and fixed ops director, even if I'm holding an event in their city, they may not be able to go let alone to a one day or two or three day event because they can't leave the store. But right. what they can do is they can watch online. They can watch it on their phone. They can watch the recording. And we got good with it. We, we reached out to a lot of the companies we work with. One of them was Update Promise. Uh, and Update Promise uh, sends texts uh, to, the, uh, to customers to let them know the status of their vehicle. And I said to Curtis Nixon, who was one of our first uh, companies who took a chance on us, I said, can we show your technology at the event and um, text the audience with their permission of who the next speaker is coming up? And so then we learned that we could bring the audience back with their permission via text, which is a tool you'd use in the service department anyway. So right. it, it all kind of worked together. So a uh, to, long answer uh, to a short question is that we're going to do our 18th event now. Uh, I've kept it virtual simply because we get the we get the big audience. I can have 120 speakers um, very easily, and it's a lot harder to put together, a lot more time consuming, as you know, by doing these connected podcasts. But when I can show technology uh, that helps the customer experience, uh, I think it's a big win win and everybody wins. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. And, and when you think about the entire ecosystem uh, of the automotive industry, right, you have you have a, a very, very broad audience. And you think about, uh, you mentioned service managers, parts managers, those guys, it, it's almost impossible to leave the store for an entire day. I mean, could you imagine uh, like the, the the fear while you're gone and the anxiety when you get back of just like, oh boy, what happened, right? It just, it, it would be overwhelming almost. So um, enabling them to, to your point, either, either watch when they have time or probably more likely, you could tell me what the stats are, but probably more likely they're watching it on demand, you know, yeah. early in the morning or later at night when they, they have a little time. Um, so you have that audience, but then you also have the collaboration factor where you're working with, um, you know, whether it be um, thought leaders that are speaking, whether it be people sharing best practices, whether it be vendors, like you mentioned, you know, companies that are, are sponsoring and things like that. There's this ecosystem that having that virtual event really, 
um, almost endorses and, and helps that ecosystem thrive. Because when you're one of the struggles that I've found for years with in-person events is you're limited in audience. You just are. Um, and, and you end up needing to take that content that, that was delivered at those in-person events and then distribute them virtually anyway. Right. So there's there's a, a love. I think all of us have for those in-person events, getting out and seeing people and, and making those connections. Um, and, and you can't replace that. But when it comes to the information and the best practices and the knowledge that can be shared virtually and, and oftentimes needs to and needs to be amplified that way so that it can get out to a broader audience. I never forget Brian Benstock, who I mentioned earlier, posting a picture on social media during one of our fixed ops roundtable early, early events. And it was a picture in his office of a big screen TV with the round play, uh, table playing and all the people sitting in his office on the couches, on the chairs, all his managers watching the event in his office. He goes, I want you to see this. And he brought and he hosted all his managers in his own office to watch the event. So, um, you know, that was new for us. And the other thing is that uh, typically when you do an in-person event, you're also subject to a lot of conditions that you don't control. Uh, we all know what's happened, you know, what has happened in the past, recent past, health-wise. You don't know if people can travel and so on and so forth. Um, and there's also people who can't speak at a certain date. But when, sure. uh, when we took it virtual uh, during those early months of 2020, uh, I went back to all the speakers who told me, no, not right now. And I said, look, I know you're not, you know, on a plane. I know you're not going somewhere and doing this or that. I know you're likely home. So <laughs> how about you speak at the event? You got nothing to lose. It's good for the industry. And I got people to speak like Jay Leno, okay, at the show that we never thought we would ever get to speak at a fixed ops roundtable simply because they were home like everybody else, okay? Yeah. And to be able to put that on, um, I think is uh, was of great value. And, you know, you look at the changes that have happened uh, in technology in our industry. You know, first, maybe it happened on the sales side and F&I. But now look at things like um, uh, we, we just had a number of companies on the roundtable. Uh, one of the technologies that we hosted uh, was uh, GoMoto at the most recent one, which mm -hmm. is a, a kiosk uh, for the customer. You know, maybe three, four years ago, a lot of folks thought that uh, a lot of service advisors may have thought, oh, gee, that's going to, you know, maybe that's here to replace me, right? I don't have to, we won't have service advisors anymore. But I think in the last couple of years, by putting these online, they've realized, oh, wait a second, that's better for the customer. I use that in other uh, instances when I go shopping or I buy food or so on and so forth. And it also gives a consistency to the dealer where every product can be offered at all times with a, with the human interaction, we may miss that or may shortcut that. So I think it's been good for everybody because it's it's created a whole new mindset in terms of what I can do with my service and parts department. Yeah, yeah, and it opens up. You mentioned GoMoto, so at the at the risk of a little bit of self promotion, like the one thing that I like about GoMoto maybe the most is the ability to open up the service drive to different hours. Right. So if I need to drop my car off in the morning before I go to work, because my wife also has to be at work and she's my like, I'm going to drop it off. I'm going to hop in her car. She's going to take me to work um, or I need to pick it up after, you know, I get done with work and I go pick up the kids and I go to soccer practice and I get dinner around and I get stuff done for tomorrow. It's eight thirty nine o'clock at night. The dealership's not open. Right. But if you have um, and a lot of dealers do this with key drop off and pick up. But when you can automate it with, you know, payment on your phone and you get a QR code and you scan it and a little locker pops open and gives you your keys back at eight o'clock at night, uh, that's that's so much more convenient. And it, it really does just open the doors for for the dealership. And frankly, it takes away a lot of that. Um, and, and this is where I think a lot of the value comes in too, is it takes away a lot of the, the menial tasks that advisors or even a cashier has to do, right? Like what, what value is an advisor adding to the process by taking a credit card, swiping it and handing it back? Right. It, they're not. And it just takes away time from their day. It's one more task they have to complete where, you know, if you have tools in place that can automate that, it makes all the difference in the world. Those little minutes add up over the course of a day, especially in the service department. There was a dealer that uh, is very close to a local hospital adjacent mm -hmm. to them. And they had this is about two years ago, installed kiosks with the hospital's permission for the employees at the hospital to be able to drop off and pick up their cars conveniently when they go into work or come out of work. And by putting that on the roundtable and talking about that, 
we had dozens of fixed ops directors, maybe maybe a hundred, okay, who said, you know what, I've got a similar type scenario at my location where I can use a kiosk. So we got to a lot of people by doing things like that, that we probably never would have in all different parts of the country and in Canada as well. So, you know, pretty neat stuff. You're right. Yeah. Well, and that type of creativity, uh, regardless of the product, like it's, it's amazing to me every day. I swear I hear some story of a dealer that, that does something and it's like, what a great idea. You know, I would have, I would have never thought of that. And, and that it just speaks to the entrepreneurial spirit and drive of almost everybody in this industry. I love it. And look at all the challenges that we've faced in the recent past and are going to be facing now in the near term future. Um, this is a very resilient audience. And I think that dealers want to hear from other dealers. They want to hear what's working. They want to hear from other fixed ops directors, parts managers, uh, service managers. Uh, Brian Benstock, I mentioned his name one more time, talked to us about service pickup and delivery in November of 2019 before any of this happened. And he was showing us a heat map of how they had been doing this for three years. And we didn't realize until maybe five months later how important that would be and how a new industry was created just by some of the things that he was doing there in Queens at Paragon Honda. And now you've got um, the ability to go to a customer's home with mobile service. Uh, yep. Tesla is doing that today. They're servicing cars in people's driveways. And you at Reynolds have a number of initiatives that are beginning to prepare dealers now for that uh, connected experience with a consumer to make it convenient so that I don't have to go to the cashier window and stand there with my credit card. I can do it like I can with any other industry, any other business and do it in the modern age. And I think that's important because we're we've been poised for disruption for a long time. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, Ted, there's something else I wanted to, to dive into, kind of shifting gears a little bit, but um, I'm interested in your perspective on it. So you've done with the Fixed Ops Roundtable, especially, but um, you've you've been involved in a lot of charitable efforts and, and giving back. You mentioned Jay Leno. That's what sparked it in my head as you were talking, because I think and, and, and forgive me, I don't have all the details on this. So hopefully you can share a little bit. But um, I mean, I think he did something that was was in, in the realm of, of a charitable kind of give back or at least awareness or something like that. And you've, you've done quite a few different events. So maybe talk a little bit about that and what that means to you, why you think it's important, um, you know, and how it resonates with with the industry as a whole. All the events that are out there from NADA on down have a great opportunity to give back to our industry. Automotive is a very charitable industry. The dealers are charitable. And what we have decided to do is once a year, uh, we will take our events and focus it on a, a charitable cause. Uh, this year is going to be the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, uh, their Dare to Dream Children's Project. And we ask our audience at the event to help us raise some funds for that charity uh, for a worthy cause. Um, one of our companies that spoke at the roundtable in February of 2020 was a company that sells in the service department um, a cleaning machine for the floor. It's like a Zamboni machine, but yeah. it's designed for bigger shops. And sure. uh, they had sold one to Jay Leno's garage and they had uh, talked to Jay and they got some backspa uh, backstage passes that year to meet him at the Mirage. And we kind of raffled those off at the round table. So the following year during um, the time when nobody was meeting in person, uh, I contacted that company who was still speaking to this day at the round table. And I said, you know, what's your relationship with Jay and what are the odds we could get him on the round table? Um, because as I mentioned earlier, I'm sure he's available and he was, uh, and <laughs> they gave me the opportunity, uh, after, you know, it wasn't an, e it was not an easy, you know, yes. After some time to speak with him on the phone and talk to him about the event, we'd raise money for charity. And I said, Jay, um, uh, I saw you speak in 1990. I was with a Ford dealer in New Jersey and you were on stage for the dealers and you told us the story how you, how you worked for a Ford dealer in New England, in Massachusetts, and you were working on the lot and you lost your job and you got fired. And it was a very funny story. He goes, you remember that story? I go, yes. I go, would you tell that at the round table and we could use that opportunity to raise money for charity? He said, I'll do it. And uh, he came on the show and he gave us half an hour and uh, I asked him about that. And he told us the whole event of how he got fired uh, when he was a lot boy working at uh, Wilmington Ford <laughs> in Massachusetts and how he got his job back by writing to uh, uh, Henry Ford II at the time oh, wow. and copying the board of directors. And uh, it's a great story. So we realized we could raise some money for charity. And uh, so now 
We're doing it uh, for leukemia and lymphoma. Uh, I am one of the uh, many people in this country that's affected by leukemia. I have CLL leukemia. Uh, a lot of people in our industry have various forms of it, okay? And I, I was diagnosed many, many years ago. Um, so uh, it's, it's dear to my heart and uh, it's a, a very worthy charity. And we bring the industry together at, at our, our events in November to do that. No, that's great. That's great. I 100% agree. It's, uh, yeah, LLS is a, a great foundation. They spread their wings far and wide, and they do a great job, um, both both raising funds and also distributing funds. So it's a good organization. It really is. Good cause. And, and it affects a, a whole lot of people and a, a lot of touching stories that we're going to share uh, of people and their, their children who've been affected by that and uh, have recovered from that. So it's a, it's, it's a great story to share. Yeah, well, that's good. That's good. It's great to hear. Uh, looking looking forward to it for sure. Um, well, Ted, you know, I could talk to you probably for for hours, maybe days, if we had some refreshments or something to to share between us. But um, want to be respectful of your time, obviously. Um, you know, before we before we hop off, though, is there anything we haven't talked about that we should, Ted? Anything you want to touch on that maybe we uh, didn't didn't get to, or you want to dive into? I think um, you know, here we are at the end of twenty twenty two, looking into twenty twenty three. Um, there's going to be a lot of changes that we mentioned earlier coming uh, down the pike. Uh, some we are aware of, some we don't even know about yet. All right. Yeah. And um, uh, we all want to get better at what we do. And there's a lot of challenges to the potential challenges to the dealer system and how we're going to operate and move forward. So, uh, you know, to put the focus on best practices and things that are working and that can be applied to my dealership, um, I think is, is important. And, uh, you know, I enjoy the, uh, you know, the, the opportunity I have to be able to, you know, to lead that and help share some of those ideas as well. Uh, as I said, I'm learning as much as anybody else is, you know, from this, Greg. So it's, it's a great time to be in our industry. 100% agree. Um, well, Ted, I couldn't thank you enough for uh, for hopping on and chatting. It's been a great conversation. Um, if there's ever anything you need, obviously, uh, you know where to find me. So I'd love to, uh, love to follow up sometime soon. But I uh, appreciate your time and have a great day today. All right. Thank you so much. Wow, what a great conversation with Ted Ings, a guy that just has a ton of knowledge, a ton of experience, and a lot to share. I really appreciate him coming on the show. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, before we hop off, don't forget, you can watch or listen to all episodes of Connected on YouTube, Apple, or Spotify podcasts, and make sure to subscribe so you're notified every other Wednesday when new episodes are released. Thanks so much, and we'll see you in two weeks. 